distinguished panelists and distinguished members of the audience. We have a great panel as you have seen and uh, I would request them to take 10 minutes each to speak to the audience. Thereafter, I will wind up and question answer session will be taken. We have Louis Moreno Ocampo, whose introduction you have already seen. I would not take time in doing that. I invite him to speak before this. Thank you very much to give me this, for give me this opportunity. I really have interest for a long time to discuss with Indian people about global justice and the idea how we can do justice for all. I will focus in a specific right. The last woman right to a permanent peace. I present woman, not just because it's politically correct, because in fact, my experience taught me that in wars, women are the, the victims, more than men. If we receive a bomb here, and some half of us survive, then when the army enemy arrive, in addition, women will be raped. Probably men will not be raped, but normally women will be raped. So that's why for me, yes, women include men, but women in particular, relevant for this topic. And um, even I was a prosecutor, and I, I had to deal with massive atrocities, first in my country and then in the International Criminal Court, I don't like to talk about the court activity, because by definition, the court work when it's late, when the crimes were committed. And the issue with crime is how to avoid the crimes, not how to punish the wrongdoers. So I will present the issue of how we can and who, what institution can protect last woman right to a permanent peace. I'm not sure in the Indian tradition, in the Western tradition, in the Anglo-Saxon Western tradition, the idea of a permanent peace starts with Westphalia Agreement, 1648. In German it's different, but in, in, in the Anglo-Saxon, and in fact, the idea started because the Westphalia Agreement was called a permanent peace, ending decades of killing each other. It was not true. There were many other wars in Europe and in the world, but everyone was quoting the permanent peace from Westphalia. So the idea of permanent peace is new. Before that, peace was just a time between war and war. I'm not sure in the Indian tradition you had the idea that it's a permanent peace or not. That's something I would like to know. Let me... Let me start with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, because he, he made two interesting comments. First, each of us has the responsibility to bring in peace to the world. So each of us has to do something. And I, what I'd like to discuss with you is what we can do. And the goal is the second dimension of his, of his comment is to make global peace. So each member of the world should be in peace. That is, for me, the two aspects I'd like to present. The first issue I'd like to present is that we are talking, and yesterday this morning we were talking about individual virtues, but in fact, in my experience, all the big criminals, all those who were killing thousands of people, were talking that they were protecting their own communities. It's not people saying, yes, I hate them and I want to kill them. No. You can, in Argentina, in my country, the generals were saying that. I remember a general who told me, Prosecutor, you have to understand, we're torturing and killing to protect our values. And <laughs> say, you cannot tell me you're killing and torturing to protect freedom and democracy. And he say, these are our values. They were the enemy. That's the concept. The concept is, as soon as my family and my community are under attack, we have the right to defend them attacking the enemies. In the, in the last case of the Yugoslavia Tribunal, General Mladic, who was responsible for the genocide in Srebrenica, he said, I'm here 
because I was defending my, my, my fellow um, people. I defended, I defended my people against the enemies. That's the concept. And that's why I like this comment from Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. He made three different levels of peace. The first one is inner peace, peace with ourselves. Second level is peace with our immediate environment, our family, friends, and workplace. And the last one, and it's the one I want to mention, is the peace between nations and continents, which is the most important, Sri Sri, because that is great wars. And to make this problem solve it is not about individual values, because as I say, the killers are invoking values to kill the others. They should have to go beyond enemies and friends. How because when we are killing the enemies, we are protecting my friends and my family. So how can we go beyond that? And that is the role of institutions. In the national settings, we have, we're in peace. We have criminality, but we're in peace. Even criminals have rights. So we have a series of institutions to make peace in the national settings, including schools, religion, the government, the Congress, the police, the prosecutors, and the courts. All the system is trying to manage violence. We have nothing like that at the global level. And that is, for me, the problem I'd like to present to you. So we are globally communicated by technology, but internationally divided by institutions. And that is the issue that we need in India. So my proposal, can India alone protect its own human rights to permanent peace? How to create an institution to manage tensions and prevent the conflict between India and Pakistan? I have to present very clearly. I think that is the biggest risk for India. And you cannot manage this risk alone. You ca India alone cannot protect its own people. If you are just building a biggest army, you are increasing the problem not reducing the problem. One of the dangers of civil democratic countries is to pass the problem to the army guys. And the army guys do what they know. They are educated, and this is the profession, to kill the others, to kill the enemy. So the idea to just enforce your army is not the solution. And so this morning we're talking about creativity and startup. We need a startup here. We need a startup how to build an institution between India and Pakistan. Because there is no global institution for that. Security Council will not deal with the problem. The, so there are two global institutions to deal with peace. One is the National Nations Security Council, which is, as India rightly say, is unbalanced. There are five countries with the power to define whatever they wanted. So you cannot put yourself in the hands of the Security Council. And the other one is the International Criminal Court. That is about punishing, it's not about preventing. That's why, for me, the issue here and the challenge I'd like to present to you is what you can do to invent a bilateral institution to manage your conflict with Pakistan. That is the only solution you have. If not, it's just raising the building weapons, both sides, increasing the tension, increasing the risk. So the only solution is invent something could be a bilateral commission, could be including people from other, 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 other countries, or include people respected in both countries, and the focus should be advisory or mandatory, and you have to decide what, how. But I really believe that is the solution that India needs, and Pakistan needs, and the world needs. And we'll end with that. I am teaching now, after my experience in, in, at the International Criminal Court, I'm trying to understand more. I'm teaching at Yale and Harvard. But what I found is Europe learned that the Second World War was the consequence of national states fighting each other. They learned the lessons. And they created the, the European Union. But they are there. They are, it's difficult for them to expand. You know, they are fighting to establish and consolidate the concept. U.S. has a different interpretation. U.S. believed that because they were isolated and a strong national state, they were able to save the world. So they are not changing. The last grand strategy of U.S. is the Cold War. There's nothing new there. So there are no ideas coming from the Western world now. And what I see from the South, we are anti-imperialist. 
We don't like global ideas because we're suffering colonialism. But now is the time to have global ideas from the South. And I believe India is the region to export this idea. And then if you fix your problem with Pakistan, you probably will teach the world how to manage global violence and how to ensure women's rights for a permanent peace. Thank you very much. Distinguished members of the audience, I will not attempt to define justice. Many people have had their say on what is the meaning of justice, including poets and philosophers. I think it's time for a hard-nosed approach to what this term means. Uh, in the recent past, uh, recent events in this country have uh, bring, uh, brought forth the meaning of justice, or what it is or what it should not be to us, in very stark terms. So let me talk about the few elements of justice which are evident uh, in our uh, social discourse in recent times. One is speed. Uh, everyone is fond of saying justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, there are some very fancy solutions that are coming forth. Uh, more courts, um, more uh, tribunals, more judges, extra working hours for courts. As somebody who is an integral part of the judicial system of this country, let me tell you that all of these are fraught with danger. Uh, having more courts, more judges is not the answer. Uh, you cannot have, this is not a quantum, it's not a problem of quantum, it's a uh, problem of quality. You cannot have more courts and more judges and have bad decision. That will be, uh, you know, completely counterproductive to the cause of justice itself. Here are a few practical solutions that I can offer. One, we often forget that we have inherited our procedures from the British Raj. Uh, we are talking about 1908, for example, the Code of Sale Procedures. So these have been amended from time to time, but there has not been any single, one single amendment uh, to uh, to modify and perhaps modernize some of our procedures. I find that the delay, the, uh, the, the justices, especially in the last four or five years, uh, people have become very aware of the backlog of cases piling up, and the judges are extremely reluctant to give uh, adjournments and uh, interfere in the normal course of, of justice. I think the, that awareness is spread to the judiciary. Uh, but at some point, the judiciary is also bound by procedure. They have to follow procedure. And perhaps we need to uh, take a hard look at this procedure. Uh, there's an excellent book by uh, Mr. Arun Mohan. Arun Mohan was a senior advocate uh, at the Delhi High Court. And uh, he, he preferred to retire and become an academic. And he has come out with this excellent volume uh, on justice and delay. And I commend that book to you because if you read that, uh, it will be an eye-opener as to how uh, lawyers, legal luminaries uh, use the court system, misuse, I should say, misuse uh, the, uh, the uh, procedural aspects of our judiciary to delay uh, matters and what could be the apparent solution. Uh, I must also, of course, warn against any, uh, uh, you know, situations where one rushes in uh, amendments piecemeal, one has to have a completely hard look at this, because that also can be fraught with danger. The other thing, of course, is I must say, uh, if you have to reduce the backlog of cases, then you have to stop the government of India being the biggest litigant in the country. Very few people know, uh, you know, we, we Indians are actually extremely litigious as a society. Our government is even more so. And, uh, you know, there are certain cases where you know, it doesn't really make sense to us, you know, some of the matters. Why would this be uh, appealed against? It is an open and shut case. They are not going to win in the appeal. But the fact of the matter is there is nobody, there is no officer, uh, if you're fighting the government on the other side, there's no officer who has the courage to stand up and say, we will not appeal this, this is a hopeless case, let's move on. So as a result, even the tiniest of issues 
when the government is in court, it will go right up to the Supreme Court. Surely this can change very easily. Uh, the other thing that we must uh, understand is the growing trend of vexatious litigation. This is a very dangerous situation. I find, and uh, because I am a commercial litigator, probably more so, but I think there's an increasing practice to, uh, to use litigation as a commercial advantage, as a competitive advantage. Uh, this is wrong. It's clearly wrong. There's already one decision of the Supreme Court a couple of years ago delivered where, uh, you know, the court said, if we find that the litigant is wasting the time of the court and, uh, uh, you know, it, indulging in frivolous litigation, then we must impose stringent costs. And I think if this decision is implemented, it will go a long way to stamping out this practice of vexatious litigation. Incidentally, vexatious litigation in some uh, uh, you know, developed uh, economies uh, uh, is actually an antitrust issue. If you indulge in vexatious litigation to, uh, uh, you know, to try and stop your competitor from launching a new product or harm him in the marketplace and ultimately the court finds that there is absolutely nothing beyond your complaint, then the tables could be turned and you could be made responsible for not just cost but also damages. We need to follow this. We need to imbibe this in our culture. The other, the other element of justice. Um, when you say, when you talk about justice, please understand, justice also means a lack of injustice. Justice is not absolute. Justice is dual. A lack of injustice will mean that we as a society have to mature. There is very often some issue in the media and then, uh, you know, there is this bloodlust. Are we going to turn into a lynch mob as a society? Are we going to demand, oh yes, we know that this guy is a culprit, let's hang him tomorrow. That is ridiculous. We are not a mature society if this is what we have come to. I think the media has to play its own role here. But I must remind everybody, and you know, I'm continuously surprised at the, you know, the level uh, of people who sometimes come out, come out and say this. I mean, in, uh, otherwise educated people. Let's do this. Let's ban that. The politics of banning. Where does that leave us? If I have started a business in this country, and I'm banned without, without any justification, is that also not injustice? Please ask yourselves this. If I am an accused, and everybody in society, leave alone the media, but everybody presumes that I'm guilty, that is the worst form of injustice. One of the cornerstones of justice is no man is presumed to be guilty unless he is proven to be so. Let us not forget this very major issue. Not guilty till proven. The other day, one of my clients called me, a private equity investor, and uh, he, he was having a legal dispute with one of the investing companies. And he says, what's happened? Has Delhi turned to Botswana? Because one of his senior executives had a sexual harassment charge slapped on him, completely fudged. And the poor man was behind bars. Now, everybody, uh, you know, has, who has anything to do with that case knows that the incident that was complained about did not happen. But I think we are also in a scenario where we have undertaken social engineering of our laws. For there to be justice, our laws also have to be balanced. Laws have to be gender neutral. Laws have to be caste and creed neutral. Sometimes our laws tend to overreach. And this overreach results in its own brand of injustice. So when we talk about justice, we must remember it's a very holistic point of view. Justice is not the crowd baying for blood that uh, demands that you know, these guys should be hanged tomorrow morning. Uh, justice is a much more complex subject and it must be understood. Some things can be done to speed up the wheels of justice and it should absolutely be done. And you know, perhaps when that happens, uh, we'll have a you know, much better system where uh, you know, this kind of uh, uh, you know, situation will stop. 
But until then, let us not forget the very tenets on which justice was framed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, friends. When I received uh, the request to speak in this session on justice for all, I was first very apprehensive because I am an economist and uh, I, I first thought, what am I going to talk about, uh, you know, law and, and justice and courts and things like that. I, I am a law-abiding citizen, I hope, but I really don't know the nitty-gritty of the legal system. And if, if I make any comments which are not technically absolutely correct, my apologies in advance to my distinguished panelists and also to you. Um, I work for UNDP, which uh, an organization that works for human development, and I'm currently posted in Nepal. Now, Nepal, as you know, is uh, coming out of a long conflict. Uh, the Maoist revolution uh, happened 10 years ago, and uh, it is now in the process of uh, rebuilding the, the, the state, writing a new constitution, uh, establishing sustained peace, and, and so on. And in all of this, good governance, of which a good judicial system is a part, uh, is very important, and UNDP works on the ground on, on, on these issues. Um, Justice-related issues related to peace in the country is one, is transitional justice. Here, what is meant is that there were a lot of Nepali people who were involved in the, com in the combat. In the, you know, they, they took up arms, they, they, they were part of the rebellion, and when the rebellion uh, ended, they now face a problem of trying to reintegrate back into the society. So one of UNDP's activities is to work on the ground to enable that they can be reintegrated into society through the judicial system. Um, there are Nepal is a country which is extremely uh, is divided across caste and ethnic dimensions. They are very, very strong there. There are a lot of groups uh, who are <clears throat> so-called marginalized and excluded. They do not have access to, um, uh, to any forms of inequality, including that of justice. So one of UNDP's intervention is to build capacity at the ground level to uh, ensure that these people get a voice, uh, get a representation. And how we do it, to give, you, give a small example, we train lawyers from the marginalized groups, the Dalits and other, other groups. We train them to become professional lawyers so that they are in a better position to, to represent and articulate the concerns of their constituencies. So that is one small example that UNDP does in the governance portfolio. Now, looking at justice uh, through the lens of an economist, let me talk to you about the Millennium Development Goals, which I'm sure you're all aware of. It is uh, coming to an end uh, next year, 2015. The MDGs set some very ambitious targets, eight targets uh, related to human development, including reduction of poverty, improvement in health indicators, education, gender equality, uh, uh, climate uh, sensitivity, and so on. Now, what we, uh, the UN community realizes at the end of the day that many countries have achieved the MDGs at the national level. You know, in terms of national averages, most of them have done well. However, if you look a bit deeper into the distribution of these achievements to the society, there is a lot more to be done. For example, uh, literacy rates have improved in many countries at the national level, but if you look at literacy rates at, uh, over different socioeconomic cohorts, you will find enormous inequality. The same is true for poverty rate. Poverty rates may have declined at the national level, but there is a lot of spatial inequality. There is inequality across socioeconomic groups and so on. So inequality is something that is very persistent, in spite of achieving MDGs at the broad national level. Then the development community is thinking, wh why so? I mean, why are we unable to tackle inequality? 
And one of the uh, uh, reasons, there are many macroeconomic reasons for, for that, how the market economy works and so on and so forth. But uh, something which is relevant to this panel is, is a form of inequality which is not very tangible in society. Uh, this could include various forms of discrimination, including gender discrimination, caste discrimination, um, and many others which, which are not as blatant as, say, theft or murder or other violent acts which can be addressed very quickly through the existing judicial system. So this is a problem. And, and it is more of a problem because it's excluded and, and, and the marginalized groups of societies who face these subtle and intangible inequalities. Okay? Now, and because of the fact that these inequalities cannot be translated into legal and concrete and implementable terms that falls within the judicial uh, framework of a country, you cannot really access justice. So there is a natural inequality which leads to all other forms of inequality, in what sense. Now, this conference is about ideas. So my submission to, to, to all of you is to think of new ideas of how to interpret these intangible inequalities in a way that they can fit into the existing system to the extent possible so that they are more easily addressed and people can actually, re actually refer that this is, this is my right. Okay? And here is the intangible inequality that, that is not written in the laws, but this is how it relates. I'll give you an example from, in the, from the recent past in India, the right for food movement. Uh, one of the innovations there uh, was to interpret the right to food as the right to life, which was already in our constitution as a fundamental right. I think one of the successes why the right to food was, was finally um, ratified by the Supreme Court, and then we have the midday meal schemes and all going, is because of this linkage that was made. Right to life means yeah, you first have right to food. So similarly, all the other intangible forms of inequality that we exist in society should be interpreted not in the letter of the, uh, by, by the letter, but by the spirit of the law and, 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 and mainstreamed into the legal systems. One last point, the MDGs have, are coming to an end and now we are thinking of post-2015 or post-MDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. There are, there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals which emphasize very strongly uh, the existence of inequality between and within countries. And this is directly reflected, uh, has a direct implication on peace that one of my uh, previous speakers mentioned. Um, so again, um, in the international forum as well, there is lack of clarity on exactly what a country's rights are legally to, to, uh, to say that I'm facing a form of injustice. So we need new ideas to articulate these intangible forms of injustice into the, the legal system. That is one, one submission. The next is the sustainable development goals are about economic, social, and environmental uh, sustainability. The last one in particular means, in short, that we do not compromise the future of our planet in order to maximize our current gains. In other words, we need to take into account the welfare of our future generations. Now, these are voices. The voices of the future generations are hitherto unheard. Okay? They are not here yet to even claim access to justice. So how do we, how do we integrate these hitherto unspoken and unheard voices of the future into our current uh, uh, legal discourses or legal debates? I know we are doing uh, a lot. There are, there are lots of agreements on climate change, environmental sustainability, but are these enough or can we do more? Can we have more ideas? I'll end with that. Thank you. Friends, you have just heard three distinguished speakers 
presenting their point of view on justice for all. So far as the subject is concerned, this is not justice delivered by the courts of law alone. Our Constitution of India, in its preamble, vows to secure to people of India justice, social, economic, political. Justice for all is really justice for all. There cannot be justice for one and the same thing be injustice to others. We have in India for decades committed the mistake of thinking that we can deliver justice to a particular class only without looking to the other classes of the society. And therefore, for a long time we believed that labor courts were meant for deciding in favor of labor. Consumer courts are there to decide in favor of consumers and so on. We have seen the worst things happening. The entire textile industry was killed in India. First it was nationalized and then killed because we wanted to do justice to labor. Workmen should not be thrown out of job and therefore the industrialists who were crying were saying that we cannot compete in the international market and we are making losses, please allow us to stop. But we had laws which said you cannot close down an industry without the permission of the central government. And then the, the result was the industries contrived to get that industry nationalized and ultimately the industry has gone down. And ultimately the labor class to whom we wanted to do justice, that itself has suffered. Likewise, there are many, many things which are going on. And we see a scenario in which if there is a conflict between a doctor and a patient, the entire society thinks the patient is always right and the doctor must have done something wrong. It is everywhere you will find such a scenario. No, that is bad. That is dogmatism. That is not justice for all. If you want to do justice, you have to just see where the justice lies. There are two players mainly, the state as well as the society. The state players are the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. Now, without having just laws, how can you expect justice to anyone? Now, your laws, if they are discriminatory, if they are in unjust, then that will result in injustice. So you will have to have just laws. The so legislature should enact just laws. The second thing is, these laws should be implemented justly. It is not that they are just selectively implemented or just looking to the convenience of people, they are implemented, not like that. They should be implemented justly. And thirdly, they should be uh, interpreted by the judiciary justly. If these three pillars of democracy or the state act justly, it will great help to bring justice to all. Then, not only this, we have to look at the society also. What are we doing? Those who run away from the scene of crime because they will be harassed by the police and they will have to go to court 20 times for standing as a witness there, they also contribute to injustice. So you have to look to this angle also. The society which is just can expect justice for all, in, for all its members. An unjust society ruled by Khap Panchayats cannot expect uh, justice for its members. So we'll have to consider all these accepts, uh, aspects and if we want justice for all, we'll have to mend our ways in all these things. We'll have to see that proper laws are uh, enacted. We have to see that they are implemented uh, properly and justly and they are interpreted by the courts justly. Our system has to work uh, within two proverbs. One is justice delayed is justice denied. The other is justice hurried is justice buried. We have, you have to have 
you see, uh, balance between the two, because I have seen justice being delivered in many courts. What is that? They want to dispose of the case. They don't want to decide the controversy. And most of the, I have seen many, many uh, judgments. I was a member of judiciary, but I confess, there are many judges who uh, dispose of the case by saying, you represent to the government, uh, you, you represent to the government within two months, and the government shall decide it within three months. The matter ends. This is only postponing justice. This is not doing justice. So such type of things are going on in the courts of law. That should be stopped. The other thing which he said, that uh, by increasing the number of judges, this problem would not go away. The problem of delayed justice because of clogging of the court. Now, uh, if you increase the number of judges, the quality of the judges is bound to go down. He, he did not, being a lawyer, he did not say in that in so many words, but I can say that quality of the judges will go down if you have 50 judges instead of 10. It is difficult for any state government to find out 10 good judges for the high court. You are asking them to increase the strength to 50 or 60. One of the high courts in India is having strength of 160. And never the sitting judges have crossed the strength of 100 because the other 60 could not be found. The, it is a self-confessed thing by the judiciary that they cannot find people to man the posts of high court judges. Now, therefore, the only way, like uh, in birth control, in, in, uh, in population control, you cannot say that you will start killing the people and bring the death, increase the death rate. You will have to decrease the birth rate. So, for a just society, you will have to see that lesser and lesser number of people have the compulsion to go to court of law. Then only the justice given by the court alone is not the justice. Justice can be done by the society itself. It can be done by people amongst themselves, realizing that whatever I am saying is wrong and I will do it myself. It's not. We have been, on the other hand, creating situations in which people have to go to court unnecessarily. I have been saying for decades, the courts have been clogged with accommodation control act cases, rent control cases. Why? It is not the duty of a citizen to provide shelter to another citizen. It is the duty of the welfare state. But we have passed it on very easily to the landlord. And ultimately, we find a scenario in which people keep their houses empty, do not give it on rent for fear that the tenant will never whack it. Now, such type of laws, if you amend them, if you bring them uh, to justice, then you will see that people will not have, uh, you see, many problems will be solved and the people will not have, uh, they will not be compelled to go to the court for getting justice. Now, uh, I open the session now for question and answer session. Which is the best legal system anywhere in the world? Are there any lessons that we can learn from that system and bring it quickly into India? Because there is a crying need. And uh, in the absence of an uh, appropriate mechanism to resolve the grievances, people have to resort to uh, the underworld uh, and other means to get their justice done, which is a reality, uh, uh, unfortunately. Fortunately, none of my clients have resorted to the underworld yet, but, <laughs> but I see what you're saying. So there is a little bit that we can always learn from everyone, but at the same time, I would like to say that our system, uh, which is a common law system, is extremely good. And, you know, I should also say that, uh, you know, the judiciary today is probably one institution that has survived the rot uh, overall, uh, I, I think. Uh, and I can safely say that. But uh, most certainly there is a lot to learn from some of the other systems. And I think the need of the hour is to take a look at our processes. So there was a, you know, a friend of mine who had a suit slapped upon her by a jealous colleague. And she said, oh, it's so, uh, you know, it's so absurd. There's no evidence. I'm sure the judge will throw it out. I said, well, look, the suit has been admitted. You're looking at three to five years. <laughs> she was shocked. So this is something that we need to build into our process, which is, you know, a very strict entry barrier. I mean, uh, people have to really look at the 
uh, look at the, uh, the evidence on record is there adequate uh, uh, you know number of tribal issues for it to even be admitted in a court so these are the little changes that we should certainly do but by and large i think our judicial system uh, uh, is is robust and uh, you know can i just like to uh, pick up on that point that in addition to um, an entry threshold um, in the UK, for instance, you have these very punitive costs in vexatious litigations. I don't see that in, in India. Could uh, Mr. Billamoria just comment on that? And the second aspect in the UK, it's almost now becoming mandatory that in a court system, that the judges uh, advise both parties to go through mediation. And uh, the statistics show that approximately 90 to 93 percent of cases are settled through mediation within a matter of days. So is there something that we can learn in India from that, the, that system? Yeah, I, I touched upon the issue of vexatious litigation and I think there's a real danger that this will, uh, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the near future, our courts will be flooded with vexatious litigation, uh, which is nothing but a, one businessman trying to stymie the other and get a competitive advantage out of a court case, which will ultimately, after five, seven years, it will be dismissed, but in the meantime, you are probably achieving your competitive goal, which you should really be doing in the marketplace. Uh, in, uh, in, in UK, I think the uh, EU antitrust uh, regulations are very clear. If you can show that there is vexatious litigation, then uh, it is a cause itself for an antitrust complaint. Now, in India, we have something similar, which is just about developed, which is uh, what is known as uh, trolls. So, any complaint where patent rights are sought to be infringed or the exercise of those rights are sought to be delayed uh, by, uh, you know, very frivolous or fraudulent claims. Uh, you know, so today our antitrust uh, body, which is a Competition Commission of India, is looking at two, three of these cases. So it is something that will come. Uh, and uh, I think courts have to now start as a matter of practice imposing very heavy costs the cost in India, when they, are, when they are imposed, and they are being imposed now more frequently than before, are in fact being uh, imposed more. But I think the quantum is so less that it is not really an entry barrier to vexation litigation. That can change. Just this question to Mr. Luis Ocampo. Uh, you suggested in your presentation, there may be a bilateral arrangement between Pakistan and India for resolution of disputes. And to ask a question, just a let me elaborate, India has one or two Pakistans more around it. We have a China, we have a Bangladesh, problems are there. Now when you suggested an institutional mechanism, maybe formal or informal, judicial or non-judicial, have you ever come across in international jurisdictions uh, having a private international institution that are catering to deciding the disputes between nations? The, there is a, the International Court of Justice is prepared to solve disputes between countries, it's there. What I'm suggesting is slightly different. I, I see there is a very legalistic discussion here, very court-oriented discussion. Uh, I love the court activities, but I realize courtrooms are for justice, like uh, surgery rooms for public health. Very important places, but the peace of the system. If you have a cholera, you don't need a surgery, a surgery room. You need a clean water. And that is my suggestion on this idea of permanent peace. Permanent peace is a concept that cannot be achieved by no, no national state can guarantee permanent peace. We need a global approach, and that is highly complicated. And that is a new demand. That's why I was saying we are communicated globally, but institutionally divided. So I have some ideas, but I think you should start to discuss. As you say, there's not just conflict with Pakistan. You have China and you have Bangladesh conflict. OK, you have different conflicts. So you have to start to invent not litigation system, prevention system, institutions to manage conflict. Peace is not the absence of conflicts. Peace is the ability to manage the conflict in a peaceful way. And that we had not. We had not system to manage conflict between states in a peaceful way. It's war or nothing. It's bombing or nothing.
And that is my invitation to you, to be creative. You are in courtroom, we are, you are still discussing common law rules, discussing between UK and India, it's fine. Lawyers can discuss forever these type of issues. I, you know, in the, in the Yugoslavia Tribunal, it was a conflict between the American prosecutor, three, lawyers, three prosecutors went to see the chief prosecutor of Yugoslavia Tribunal. The American prosecutor say, I cannot work here, it's a shame. In two weeks, will be a witness. I invite my colleagues to prepare the witness, and they refuse to do it. I cannot work here. The British, the, the British prosecutor say, in, in London, I will be disbarred. Prepare a witness, it's, it's a fault, I will be disbarred. And the Scottish prosecutors say, in Scotland, it's a crime. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the type of conflict between lawyers. We discuss details and also courtroom activities. My proposal is a big picture of justice, guaranteeing, protecting peace. is not a task of one national state alone, cannot do it. And in the case, in this interesting case, because you have these three conflicts, it's, it's time of creativity, Indian creativity on managing and preventing conflict. That's my invitation. So I had a question on something you touched upon in your final comments. Uh, justice for all is predicated on the assumption that anyone who wants justice has access to justice delivery systems. So uh, there are large parts in a country. For example, there are Kangaroo courts in West Bengal. There are Khap Panchayats in Haryana, which have legitimacy because they are the only dispute resolution mechanisms available to people in that area. So my question is, for, is twofold. First of all, do you think that if we increase the access uh, of district level courts in these areas, they will delegitimize these institutions that have cropped up in our society. And if they will, if the answer is yes, how do we go about improving the reach of our district court system in the country? First of all, you see, uh, judiciary is a pyramid. You have to have base. So basic courts, that expansion is more, uh, you see, that is required, more required, because directly, uh, people don't go to high court directly. They have to access the first court. The civil courts, district courts, they will have to be spread over evenly throughout India. But uh, the difficulty is the court does not mean judge alone. Court means well-equipped lawyers, the good libraries, good infrastructure. Then if you post a judge there, if you want him to be there, you have to provide for his family educational institutions in the area which can cater to his children, medical uh, facilities to cater to his parents or his, himself or the entire family. All these things are very, very necessary. Otherwise, we find hundreds of courts in India, they have been created, but they are without judge. Because judges go there and from the first day they start, you see, pestering the higher courts to take them out and place them in some urban area because their children are going to school or because their ailing parents are there. So, you see, that is also not very easy. Infrastructure, as soon as uh, you increase the infrastructure in the rural areas, and you will find that the courts will also reach there. The reason for which doctors do not go to rural areas, the same are the reasons why judges and lawyers would not like to go there. And therefore, creation of infrastructure is the key. When you do that, and in the rural areas, the infrastructure is provided matching the urban areas, then people will like to, uh, they will prefer to go to uh, that area because they are kings there. In a big city, a small judge is a small fry. In a small place, he is the only member of judiciary and who uh, uh, see, is a very important person in that locality. People would like to go. So therefore, that problem is not only with judiciary or justice for all, means first of all, we will have to provide economic justice by spreading evenly the, our infrastructure. Uh, my name is Nishit Desai. I happen to be an international corporate and tax lawyer. Uh, two things. Justice for all, there is a whole life cycle. It starts with legislation, goes into the government administration, and then judiciary. Fundamentally, as I see in the life cycle, first problem that we are encountering is drafting of laws has gone very bad. One practice which was excellent, which we dropped recently, is that of law commission. Direct taxes code, there was no law commission. Indian companies, new act, no law commission. Now what happens as a result is that laws are so badly drafted, which gives discretion and powers to the bureaucrats or otherwise, they also don't know in what direction to decide at times. And then matters come to the court 
every single matter goes in. So this is one whole life cycle we need to address some point in time. Second question was raised, what best practices possibly we can do? Uh, I do a lot of work in Singapore. Now, uh, first of all, as far as justice administration is concerned, the judges are paid, there are few judges, but paid well and trained well, number one. Number two, the discipline is that nobody would be given unnecessary adjournment. It's, if you, you have to advance, in advance you have to tell one hour hearing, it happens in one hour. If your matter goes on, you will be adjourned, but somebody else waiting in the queue will not have to be. I think some of those micro-level processes we really need to search for. There are a lot of reports already written. Even if we can dig out and do that, that would be very, very helpful. I think so, well, life cycle process re-engineering, what we yes, call, yes. would be very critical. I think there are a few yes. uh, thoughts that I have. Yes, I, I agree with your comments. Uh, but you see, what happens is, in India, unfortunately, the, the executive has handed over everything relating to judiciary and ju judicial administration to the courts. I don't think anywhere in the world the law secretary would be a member of judiciary. In all our states, the law secretary is a sitting district judge went on deputation. And he tells the government that the high court wants this to be done. God knows whether the high court wants or he himself wants. And the politicians who are political bureaucracy they do not have the guts to challenge him or to say this is our thing. Everywhere, I was a uh, part of High Court administration for a long time. I know it. The constitution gives the uh, executive the power to make procedural laws for High Courts and different courts. And what they do in, in every state is ask the High Court to frame the rules and then they call those rules. Now, Similarly, law commission. Now, in a law commission, who should be the expert? Legislators. Pe those who have direct link with the people, those who can feel the pulse of the people. And we are putting them there, senior most retired judges. Law commission of India, they put chief justice of India. Now, you, uh, your observation is correct. Judges think that they are omniscient. They are not. Because I know from my own experience, having not done a single criminal trial in my practice, I was a civil lawyer. I was, the next week of my appointment, I was asked to sit over a bench which was hearing criminal appeals, murder appeals. Now, you see, it's atrocious. And for a conscientious judge, it is killing. I, I remember those days when I used to write from, I was always in doubt whether I am doing right, whether I am doing right. This is, this is what is happening in India. So training of judges is also a very important thing to which you have adverted. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, so my question is for the Honorable Justice itself. Uh, sir, a very brief point. So why is there so much resentment in the bench against the National Judicial Appointments Commission bill? I mean. It looks like the bench doesn't want any executive interference when the legislature is trying to infuse some level of accountability in the appointment of judges. We see across the spectrum that there are a number of families, a respective caste denomination, who are majorly dominating the high courts and the higher courts. Sir. So I would just like to invite some comments of you. It will be very nice. So the first thing I tell you, uh, a judgment or a judge's view is known through judgment only, not through observations reported, re, reported in the press. A judge may uh, tell the lawyer, you have no case for 10 times, and 11th time it may strike him that there is something in it, let us issue notice. And he orders no issue of notice. What is reported? 10 times the judge said that there is, uh, there is no, nothing in the case, and at 11th without this, Without any reason, he admitted the case. Now, this is not, you see, you have to take a final word from the judiciary only through judgments. What you are saying is observations made by individual judges outside that they are not views of the court. Because views of the court depend, they are formulated after hearing both the sides, they are, they come out in the judgments. Till then, everything is tentative expression, it is not final expression. Yes. 
So the discussion, uh, of course, the discussion which is centering around the Indian judiciary and the Indian uh, judicial system. You know, last uh, 30, 40 minutes, whatever I've heard, I, as a common man, I go back uh, with the feeling that no solution exists. And the common man will continue to stand for ages in the, la in the queue. With the, with the August gathering here, I would request, I mean, if there are tangible solutions or some suggestions, they should be forwarded to the persons concerned. For 30, 40, 50, 60 years, we have been discussing, debating at every fora, my forum. But nothing, I mean, we, I, I, at least as an individual, I go back with this discussion with no, uh, no nothing concrete. So, uh, the point really is, uh, as a common man, you know, should you really be, uh, you know, having recourse to a court of law? Because I think everyone should be very clear that litigation should always be the last recourse. Even as a litigator myself, my counsel to my clients, first of all is, please see if there is a way to settle this matter. Because litigation can be destructive, it can destruct your business, it can be destructive of the subject matter of the litigation. So, what I would like to say is that as a common man, really the, uh, the need of the hour is to ensure that you don't really need to go to a court of law. I mean, if there's a family law matter or something like that, that's fine. But as uh, the uh, Honorable uh, retired uh, Chief Justice mentioned, uh, you know, we should not be having case, uh, you know, backlog of cases on rent control because it is an absurdity. So, you know, the whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, effort is to try and, uh, you know, ensure that the number of cases coming up and the need of the common man to really indulge in uh, litigation is obviated to a very large extent. I think litigation should really be commercial litigation or, uh, you know, criminal litigation, that is destructive of the subject matter of the litigation. I am missing the Indian creativity here. I remember reading a case in a small community in India, the, a neighbor had a guest, had no money, so he went to the house of his neighbor and he stole a, a chicken. He cooked the chicken and solved the problem, but the next morning his neighbor realized the problem and they had a fight and the stealer in a fight killed the, own, the owner of the chicken. And it was a big problem, and the community make a decision. This person has to feed the family of the dead person for the rest of his life. At the beginning, it was complicated, and the guy just put the food on the door. But one day after a year, the, wife, the widow saw the neighbor say, come on, pass. And they have a dinner together. And they started restoring the relation. Because the neighbor loved, the, stealer, the killer loved the victim, but he had just a mistake, and he was feeling so guilty. And then one was so guilty that one day he went to the city and was drunk and started to say, I killed my neighbor, I killed my friend. And then the police took him and he confessed before the police. So the judge was coming and was a big problem, what to do now? So the leaders of the community went to see the judge and said, look, this is a problem. We solved this issue. And the judge said, okay, go to see this person that he, will, he, he, should, he should declare innocent. And there were no evidence except his confession. So I had to release him. Okay, it's a great idea. They went to see the person and they explained to him, this is what you do. Then, courtroom, trial, start, and the judge asked, are you innocent or guilty? And the defendant stand and say, your honor, I know you told me I should say I'm innocent, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm guilty. So, disaster. So, the widow jump and request to be listened, and then she explained, my neighbor loved so much my husband that he became he killed, but it's not true, was someone who passed and went. And then the judge was very happy acquitting. But the story is nice to show community system here was working. And then you can expand that with internet and other models, but that is what I need to hear you. And you, you look like a British lawyer. Come on. You're from India. Be creative. Three last so, Sunil Kanodia from Shrey, Calcutta. If an illegitimate child is born in society, would society kill the child? Or it may have its rules, regulations to punish the parents, but the child would need to get adopted and taken care of. Similarly, there have been instances in the, in the judiciary in the last couple of years whereby the baby has been killed because it was born illegitimate rather than punishing the parents. 
is that analogy correct and should this be looked at uh, within the judicial system? See, the analogy is not correct, I think. <laughs> because you see, no, uh, no law sanctions killing of a child or infant or even an embryo. The, uh, you see, what is happening is we our haphazard uh, you see, approach towards every problem. We just grope for answers because we, the, in India, uh, I'll tell you, there, there was one of a religious leader. He was uh, some 10 years back, uh, he was being asked, grilled by a television anchor. He had a case going on against him. He said, whether you will accept the uh, judgment of the court against you or not. He avoided for three, four times. And the fifth time again he was asked, he said, yes, I will abide by the judgment if it is in my favor. So this is the uh, people feel that if they win, justice has been done. If they lose, then injustice has been done to them. No, such, a, such an approach is not going to help us. We'll have to have a holistic approach. The ideal thing is people go to the court when they are in real doubt. Both parties are really in doubt about where justice lies. Here, almost 60-70% cases, people know that their side is wrong, but they take advantage of the system. They can prolong. Just like I know I'm a tenant, I know that I will have to vacate. My landlord has a genuine cause. But if he sues me, it will take 20 years for him to take position. During that time, I will build my own house. So that type of thing is going on. So the society is also responsible for it. You will get, just like you get the government you deserve, you will get the judiciary you deserve. The same thing will happen. Yes, lady. You mentioned about neutrality, sir. You mentioned about uh, gender neutrality, caste neutrality. But uh, treating unequals equally, wouldn't that be a very big injustice? And the second thing is, uh, would you like to throw light on uh, checks and balance within the judiciary itself? Because as we see, judges are also human beings and uh, they are fraught with frailties. So there are errors of omission in commission. So what would be a way out for that? Sure. I think uh, two very good questions and thank you for asking this actually. So uh, look, the point is the law does not recognize inequality as far as the law is concerned. All human beings are equal. So therefore, the remedy should also be equal. That, that's the point. There is no injustice or imbalance in the law. Now, there may be certain social ills that we are trying to eradicate. And the way to eradicate those social ills is to ensure that justice is speedy. But speedy justice and erroneous justice resulting in uh, gross injustice you know, there's a big difference. So we have to have a legal system where all men are equal in the eyes of law. Now, men includes women. You know, I always say chairperson. I never say chairman or chair lady. Right? So all, when you say men, it includes women. So whether you are a lady or a woman, you are equal in the eyes of law. You will you'll get the same treatment and the same punishment. That That's really the... Uh, meaning of justice according to me. Uh, on the second point, yes, uh, you know, uh, judges are also human. And in fact, uh, you know, in the recent past, and I think again, you know, the chairperson touched upon that, that, you know, we are seeing uh, judgments of late where at least, you know, so what has happened in the last uh, five to six years, uh, you know, the concept of white collar crime has really hit the headlines. Uh, there is a lot of public anger about corruption. Now, yes, absolutely, corruption should be stamped out. There is no question about that. But does that warrant, uh, you know, our well-established norms of jurisprudence changing? I don't think so. Uh, so there are certain checks and balances that have been built into the law. Again, I'm saying our foundations are very, very robust. And if, because of the pressure, the social pressure of trying to weed out corruption, if there is an overreach and uh, well-established norms, uh, you know, that are time-tested are changed, then it can only result in injustice in the future to someone else. 
So we have to be very mindful of this issue. Uh, as far as uh, you know, judges being human, you know, I reiterate, uh, you know, the judiciary is the one institution that has survived the rot. There are exceptions like everywhere. But uh, please believe me, when you, uh, you know, a lot of people come to me and say, oh, will you take over this case? Uh, you know, what happened? So, you know, you know, the judge was biased. I said, who told you? My previous lawyer. The best defense of a lawyer who loses is to say that the judge was biased or the other side had bribed him. Please don't believe this because it spoils the name of the judiciary. I mean, did you, as, your, as a lawyer, did you, uh, you know, pull out all the stops? Did you take all the arguments you had to take? Uh, I mean, let's introspect a little before we point fingers. I am Ashok Junjunwala, a professor at IIT Madras. Uh, last year, I remember that there was a very popular judgment um, in Supreme Court. Court told the government that you cannot take more than three months to do a certain things. Uh, three months is the upper limit that they can take. Uh, I want to sort of use that and sort of say that is it worthwhile to sort of say that any low court, lower court, should not take more than one year to decide on any matter. Can we say a time limit, not more than 12 months? And can we say that all upper courts after that, after the first judgment is done, up, it can go all the way up. Together, it should not take more than 12 months, more. So I'm sort of saying upper limit, can we have two years? The reason why I am even saying that, and I may be totally wrong, it doesn't matter, is that case, I, I, I heard that Justice Harid is horrible and all that, but when one delays it by five years, 10 years, 15 years, it just loses the meaning. In almost all cases, everyone is suffering. Can the judicial system itself put a timeline, to 12 months and 12 plus 12 months? In rarest of the rare case, they could look at something more than that. So again, uh, you know, the, first of all, there is always this issue of speed and I touched upon that. I think speed is an issue and all I'm saying is that there are ways to redress it. These are really the low hanging fruits. Let's do those first. Imposing a timeline on any case, so each case differs. Uh, now, if you look at, say, criminal cases, now, you know, a case involving a uh, you know heinous crime, murder, uh, would you know the evidence would be few pages. What is there? What what is the evidence? How many witnesses witness, uh, saw the murder? Is there a weapon? Is there that smoking gun, the proverbial smoking gun? In uh, cases involving white collar crime, some of the uh, you know evidential documents run into thousands of pages. So to impose a overall time limit is just not practical and it will not be fair. We would be better off redressing the procedural issues. We would be better off, so please imagine, uh, put yourself in the shoes of the victim and the accused. Now if your trial, suppose you are being tried, heavens forbid, right, it's, it's a horrible experience, but if you are in the shoes of a accused person and you are told that, you know, in two years, there has to be a decision. Now your trial is not even, you have not even had the opportunity to cross-examine the witness and that, and the judge has to deliver a judgment. Would that be justice? Absolutely not. So deal with the steps that have to be taken. Deal with the uh, micro level issues where there are, uh, you know, uh, there is a case for redressal. So we have overshot the, our time uh, and therefore I will end up this session by thanking my co-panelists as well as the audience for a very good interactive session. Thank you.